Annie Ball is going, Annie Bell, sorry, is going to read from her book, Curious Incident of the Glass Eye. So can we all come up? Annie. Hi, hi. What's going on here then? Inspector Bailey's voice boomed into the waiting room, completely inappropriate in the circumstances. When Jones had called the station to say there had been an unfortunate incident in the local doctor's surgery involving a glass eye, he couldn't prevent his inner comedian from dancing the foxtrot in the darkest recesses of his mind. Thus he had wandered, unbidden, into the worst social faux pas of his career to date. Before him was a scene of absolute horror. Two elderly ladies sat on one side of the room, clutching their handbags with both hands, hands which he noticed were much shakier than you would expect, even from the elderly. As he made the observation, Bailey made a mental note to put his name down for that course he had seen advertised back at the station, banishing your prejudice, open-minded policing for a more peaceful community. Again, that evil fox-trotting comedian reared his waxy moustache head. Imagine a version of the London riots you lived, where the pensioners tore around the city burning things because of some terrible police-related injustice, probably involving tea and biscuits. Bailey shut him out, focusing on the task at hand. Two old ladies shaking, their eyes focused glassily on the centre of the room where a pool of blood was slowly congealing, forming a sticky crust on the parquet flooring. In the pool lay a man, or at least he used to be. Slim build, might have been six feet, feet tall had it not been for the unfortunate absence of his head. His sharp pinstripe suit was a write-off, his glossy shoes redeemable. Bailey, he yelled at himself, never mind the suit or the shoes, where the hell is the man's head? Looking around him, the answer was obvious. It was sprayed all over the wall adjacent to the old ladies and all over a poor teenager and a little boy sitting in front of the wall. Their silhouettes formed white figures within the fine spatter marks. It looked like a graffiti artist had spray-painted the man's brains onto the wall. This was going to cost psychiatric a lot. At that moment, Jones walked in, pulling on a pair of latex gloves. Ah, oh, Bailey, he beamed. What do you make of all this? Bailey paused a moment. Different. Just had a chat with the receptionist, Jones revealed. She reckons it was the weirdest thing. This guy, the headless horseman over there, walks in demanding to see a doctor. He's not a patient here, so she pesters him for his details, and he just shouts at her all aggressive-like and demands to see a doctor. She notices he has a glass eye which has a light blinking in it. He screams this blood-curdling scream, his head explodes just like them fembot things in Austin Powers, only... Jones indicated the carnage behind him. A bit messier. Bane was incredulous. Are you telling me his glass eye blew his head off? Cool, huh? Jones loved a gruesome crime scene. Hmm, Bailey grunted. He pulled a pair of latex gloves from his pocket and tugged them onto his hands, satisfaction filling in as the flexible material snapped against his skin. He examined the reception desk and noticed a small circular object. Pulling a pair of tweezers from his inside pocket, he picked it up and dropped it into a transparent ev evidence bag. He glanced at it. It glanced back. Bailey jumped. It was a halo of hazel iris with a minute circuit board on the reverse side. James, Bailey yelled, I found the detonator. A few minutes later, forensics were on the scene. One of them handed Jones a wallet. Found it in his pocket, the young man proclaimed, as though he expected a medal or something. Bailey sniggered him to himself. Bloody newbies and their damned enthusiasm. They'd learn. Jones thanked him. The wallet contained a driving licence with an address in London and a receipt from a B&B down the road. The man's name, it seemed, was Victor Cyclops. Bailey's inner comedian sniggered and twirled his moustache. Bailey kicked him aside. It was a starting point, at least. Leaving forensics to work their magic, Bailey and Jones climbed into Jones's BMW and drove to Castle House, the B&B. Pulling up outside, the street was eerily still. Bailey looked at the building, a Victorian house with serious delusions of grandeur. Did a house really need battlements where the fascias should be? Bailey realised he needed to get his grumpy side under control. He was in danger of giving Victor Meldra a run for his money. Bailey padded sharply down the concrete path, straightening his jacket before rapping smartly on the door. A slender lady opened it. Her old-fashioned attire and perfectly set pensioners' perm suggested she seemed much older than she was. Good morning. Welcome to Parrot House. Her parrot-like voice pealed into the street. I'm Mrs Bray. D.I. Bailey, he flashed his badge, and this is D.I. Jones. At the mention of his name, Jones ceased picking moss off the garden wall, inexpertly brushed the dirt from his hands and flashed his badge at Mrs Bray. She raised a cursory eyebrow at him before turning back to Bailey, who went on. Did you have a customer recently by the name of Cyclops? She thought for a moment. Cyclops? Cyclops? Yes. Left this morning in a hurry. Had three more days booked in, but paid and rushed off. Weird coincidence, that. Man with a glass eye called Cyclops. He was a weird one. Come in, officers. 
They both stepped into the hallway, feeling as if a world of chintz was swallowing them. That man, Mr. Cyclops, she looked pointedly at Bailey. He was an odd one. Had a glass eye, right? But it was looked wrong. All still and unnatural. Never seen one before, never want to again. Have you cleaned his room yet? Not yet. Can I look? Bailey interrupted her. Of course, room three, just on the left as you go up the stairs. Wipe your feet. She reached up to a rack of keys and handed him one. Bailey headed up the stairs, trying not to look too closely at the giant floral pattern on the wallpaper, which clashed horribly with the magenta woodwork. Reaching room three, Bailey turned the key in the lock. A musty aroma of sweat and feet assaulted his nose. He flicked on the light. None of Cyclops' possessions were there. The bed linen was rumpled and the curtains were still closed. Checking the avocado on the suite, Bailey resigned himself to the fact that some people would never develop good taste. Before leaving, Bailey looked in the bin where he found an empty Vaseline jar. Unbid and all manner of unpleasant thoughts entered his mind. Pushing them and his inner comedian to one side, he popped the jar in an evidence bag and headed downstairs. Chatting with Mrs Bray, Jones saw Bailey and nodded. They were both ready to go. Bailey handed Mrs Bray his card. As they climbed into the car, Bailey grinned at Jones. Did she tell you anything else? Not much, Jones replied. Reckon Cyclops worked for some advanced prosthetics company, developing tools to help the disabled or some lot. Very noble, I'm sure. Interesting, Bailey smirked. I found a massive empty Vaseline jar in his own suite. Bloody Vaseline, Jones snorted. Wife makes me buy vats of that stuff for her chapped hands. Loves it. Bloody Kenny sniggers every time I go in. I hate the stuff, I hate it. At the station, Jones proclaimed. We need to chat with Ruddles about this one. I suppose we do, Bailey agreed reluctantly. They turned left and nodded on Ruddles' office door. Come in, a strange voice called out. Jones glanced at Bailey and pushed the door open. Chief Superintendent Ruddle sat behind his large desk, glaring at the two DIs, indicating that they should take a seat. Bailey, Jones, his gravelly voice echoed in their ears. I heard from uniform about the headless man. Nasty business, I'm sure. What do you know so far? Well, Jones began twiddling his fingers nervously. Um, we know he's from London, Bailey jumped in, but there are no other leads. So strange, Ruddles glanced up as if imagining something. Why would a man's head off with his own glass eye? Not what you call subtle. Our murderer must be an evil genius. Check his place out. I'll call the Met to smooth things over with him. Jones and Bailey took this as their cue to leave. Nodding to Ruddles, they walked towards the door. What's wrong with you, Jones? Bailey hissed once safely back in the corridor. I'm a coward and Ruddles scares me, he muttered, putting on a squeaky girlish voice. Bailey chuckled. You're an idiot, he replied affectionately. Two hours later, both men stood outside an impressive townhouse. They climbed the steps and knocked on the glossy blue front door. A moment later, a slender, elegant lady peered out, tucking a smooth blonde curl behind her ear. Detective Inspectors Jones and Bailey, Jones beamed. Bailey elbowed him viciously. He hated it when Jones got all excited over pretty girls. It distracted him from his work. May we come in, madam? Bailey asked, flashing his badge. We have reason to believe that Victor Cyclops resides at this address. Yes, she replied. He's my brother. She looked worried. Is he okay? I think we need to come in, Bailey said softly. He hated this part of his job. A few minutes later, the news had been broken, tears had been shed, and now questions were being asked. How did he die, Inspector? Can I see him? This made Bailey's knees itch. How do you tell a mourning woman that her brother has quite literally lost his head? He decided to avoid the issue for the moment. Can we have a look around, please, Miss Cyclops? He replied. Kerry, she corrected him. Excuse me? Miss Kerry, she clarified. After he lost his eye, Victor changed his name by Depot for love. I never did get it. Tears welled up in her eyes. Jones winking handed her a tissue. Look in the attic, she moaned miserably. Victor spent a lot of time there. Find out what happened to him. As Bailey clambered into the attic space, he was astounded. Cyclops had a complete laboratory in his roof. Casting his eye around the room, Bailey was mesmerised by sections of pipe interlinking with beakers and test tubes. Post-it notes were stuck everywhere. Look, yelled Jones. He had found a leather-bound volume. They flipped through it. About halfway through the volume, Bailey noticed an exploded diagram of what looked like an eyeball, only it contained various microcircuits. He pushed the book into an evidence bag. They had what they needed. The next day, Ruddles called Bailey and Jones into his office. Forensics got back to us, lads. They examined that book you discovered. And, Bailey asked. Apparently, old Cyclops was an experimental scientist, Ruddles explained. He found a way to restore vision to people who had lost their eyes. His glass eye was a prototype. Although it worked perfectly, the medical companies wouldn't take it on other than safety grounds. How so? Jones was intrigued. Well, Rogers went on, in order to work, the glass eyes had to, had to be filled with natural glycerine, 
See it within the eye, it seemed stable. The flaw in the design was that there needed to be some conductivity between the prosthesis and the optic nerve. Lining the back of the prosthesis with magnesium worked best. You know about magnesium, right? Bailey vaguely, 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 vaguely remembered his teacher pulling strips of magnesium from a jar of oil and then holding them in the air, only to watch them burst into blinding white flames. Vaseline, Jones called out. That's what the Vaseline was for. I don't follow, Ruddles answered, irritated. Magnesium bursts into flames upon contact with the air, right? Jones went on. Vaseline would be the perfect material to exclude the air from the magnesium whilst allowing the electrical signals to be conducted to the optic nerve. It's perfect. Ah, Bailey added, the penny finally dropping. The jar of Vaseline in the B&B was empty. He must have woken up that morning but couldn't quite scrape enough out of the pot. He was probably on his way to the chemist when the magnesium started to burn. And he ran into the doctors in the hopes they could help him, Jones added. I don't suppose he was thinking logically by that point. No, Bailey went on. The magnesium heated the nitroglycerine to the point where an explosion was inevitable. He literally lost his head. The end.